can see the number, yeah? Yeah, yeah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين يبخلون ويأمرون الناس بالبخل ويكتمون ما آتاهم الله من فضله وأعتدنا للكافرين عذابا مهينا والذين ينفقون أموالهم رئاء الناس ولا يؤمنون بالله ولا باليوم الآخر ومن يكون الشيطان له قرينا فساء قرينا وماذا عليهم لو آمنوا بالله واليوم الآخر وأنفقوا مما رزقهم الله وكان الله بهم عليما إن الله لا يظلم مثقال ذرة وإن تك حسنة يضاعفها ويؤت من لدنه أجرا عظيما فكيف إذا جئنا من كل أمة بشهيد وجئنا بك على هؤلاء شهيدا يومئذ يود الذين كفروا وعصوا الرسول لو تسوى بهم الأرض ولا يكتمون الله حديثا يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارى حتى تعلموا ما تقولون ولا جنبا إلا عابري سبيل حتى تغتسلوا وإن كنتم مرضى أو على سفر أو جاء أحد منكم من الغائط أو لامستم النساء أو لامستم النساء فلم تجدوا ماء فتيمموا صعيدا طيبا فامسحوا بوجوهكم وأيديكم إن الله كان عفوا غفورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي We'll do a summary of what we did last week and then we'll move on inshallah and I'd like to answer uh, the brother's question uh, before we uh, move on with the class today because it relates to what we did last week So last week we mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed us to do ibadah and not do shirk and then there were multiple categories of people that we were asked to do ihsan to, which were the parents, the relatives, orphans, the poor people, the neighbor that is close, the neighbor that is far, and the close friend or the wife, and the wayfarer or the traveler, and those that are slaves. Inna Allah la yuhibbu man kana mukhtalan fakhura. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like the one who does kibr, who has arrogance and has uh, a pride over what he has been given. The question I got asked was, and we discussed that ihsan has four types, which is qawl and fi'al and mal and hal. And we described how these apply to the different categories. And so for example, the ihsan to the parents although it is in those four categories, is to a different degree than it, what it would be to your neighbor, for example. And all of those are deserving of ihsan. The question I asked was, what if a relative is a non-Muslim? Then what will happen there? And the same principle applies if the parent is a non-Muslim. In that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that ihsan to the parents will happen regardless of whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. The only difference is if the parent is a non-Muslim, then you will not have wood. And the wood is love. right? So the ihsan to a non-Muslim parent is to do the khidmah, is to give them the money to say good things to them and to present yourself in a good way as I mentioned but the love that a person has for a Muslim brother a Muslim relative, a Muslim parent is not going to be the same as the person who has a 
father or mother who is a kafir or a relative who is a kafir. So for example, the relative is a kafir and he is poor and you are rich, then you will extend your hand to him, meaning you will help him monetarily, even though he is a kafir. That side of things does not stop your ihsan to them. And in addition to that, just like you would do da'wah to the non-Muslim, the relative who is a non-Muslim is of greater haq of, of the da'wah that you should be giving. Does that answer the question? That is da'wah, but uh, the, the, my question was about the Ahmadis. You know? Yes. They are the enemies of our Prophet Yes. So they made another Prophet. So they are the worst kind of uh, humans in my sight. So should we be still uh, behaving, doing a son to them as well? Okay, the worst kind of kafir is the mushrik. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, all other kuffar come after that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Ahlil Kitab a special place. Right? So the Ahmadi doesn't become the worst kind of kafir in that sense because the mushrik is the worst kind of kafir. So the da'wah, just like we give da'wah to the mushrik, you will also give da'wah to the Ahmadi. And it is only through keeping the relationships that you will be able to give da'wah of some kind. Yes, I'll let you have the question. Well, I didn't understand uh, special place to the... To the Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, Ahl al-Kitab. To the what, people of the book. What do you mean special place? So he has put them in closer to the Muslims, even though they are kafir. But aren't they mushrik? Even though the Ahl al-Kitab are mushrik, in the strictest sense of the word. They do shirk, both the Yahud and the Nasara, they do shirk. Yeah. But Allah has put the mushrik that are not Ahlil al-Kitab as the worst kind, oh, okay. separate so to Ahlil al-Kitab. So, so he has put, there are a different class of mushrik then. Oh, so that. for example, the Hindu, okay? Yeah. The Hindu is class as a mushrik, yeah. right? He's not from Ahlil al-Kitab, right? So from our eyes, yeah. that kind of mushrik is the worst kind of kafir. And Ahl al-Kitab, even though they're also doing shirk, are not in the same category as the Hindu. And between us and Ahl al-Kitab are lots of concepts that are similar, right? So for example, as in, and I don't want to spend too long in this, for example, is that we believe in the Day of Judgment. They also believe in the Day of Judgment. We believe in the, the coming of the Dajjal. They also believe in the coming of the Dajjal, right? And in the strictest sense, they also believe in one ilah. Right, so when you ask the Nasara, they say we believe in one God. Yeah. Their concept of one God has shirk in it. Mm. Okay. Just like you would say that the one who is going to the grave and doing sujood to the grave, he mm. says I believe in one God, mm -hmm. but I'm doing sujood here because I think I'm going to get something this way. But he is not a muahid; he is a mushrik, and he leaves Islam when he goes to the grave. Right, but he's not in the same category as the Hindu person. Do you understand that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Inna Allah yaqfiru dunuba jamia. Jamia, yeah. He forgives everything except shirk. Except shirk. Except shirk. So does that mean all mushrik or yes? All mushrik. All mushrik. And from, you know, here you can get yes, into exactly. different things that we will we'll come on to today, inshallah. But I want to move on today. Um, I number 37, inshallah. What was the word wood? Wood is mahabba, is love. <laughs> and uh, you will find if you go into Qad Samia Surat Al Mujadala in the last ayah, La tajidu qawmin yu'minuna billahi wal yawm al akhiri yuwaduna. Wood comes from yuwaduna, right? Or you, I should say the other way around. Yuwaduna comes from wood, and wood is. They mahabba. And in Surah Al Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, it is not for people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the last day to take their fathers or their brothers as a wali if they uh, are not Muslim. لا تتخذوا يا أيها الذين لا تتخذوا آباءكم وإخوانكم أولياء إن استحبوا الكفر على الإيمان. So you're not allowed to have them as a wali, and you're not allowed to have them as 
a wood okay but still doing the ihsan is there okay and so um, it is mentioned about uh, I believe it was um, one of the Sahabi if I remember correctly it was Asma bint Abi Bakr who mentions that her mother came and she asked what should I do in terms of Ihsan because she is a kafir and the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you should still do Ihsan because she is your mother that daraja is not removed as a result of her kufr let's move on inshallah الذين يبخلون ويأمرون الناس بالبخل الله سبحانه وتعالى says that he does not love إن الله لا يحب من كان مختالا فخورا so the man here instead of saying الذين uh, يبخل so instead of saying من Allah has put in الذين يبخلون okay so it is بدل of من كان so these people do um, uh, بخل right and they order other people to do bukhul as well. And what is bukhul? That a person eats himself and he does not spend on others. And then there is another category that is even more miserly that does not spend on himself either and doesn't spend on other people either. Okay? So both, both categories uh, are disliked and the two categories that are liked are those that spend on themselves and spend on others okay and then the Rayan if you can uh, mute yourself Jazakallah khair. and then the last category is the Mujawad who doesn't spend on himself and he spends on others all right and then this is the best kind of category and obviously the hardest kind not to spend on yourself and to spend Bakhil on Bakhil? others sorry no 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 opposite of Bakhil okay so that's the highest Shafi. analogy isn't it? the, the highest is the the one who is Jawad <coughs> right? the one who doesn't spend on himself and he spends on others okay oh. Ani he spends on the minimum amount or not even given himself everything mm. that he needs Okay, so for example, someone has enough money just to be eating three times a day. So he said, that, look, this my brother is poorer than me. So, subhanAllah, I don't know what's happening to my keyboard. Um, <laughs> my brother is poorer than me, so I will have two meals today. And my third meal, I give to my brother. So he is being jawad. Do you understand that? And then the other one who is a um, generous person is spending on himself and spending on others as well right and by and large this is a category that we can try and do mm-hmm. the bakhili is the one who doesn't spend on others and the sharia says the one that is sinful is on whom it is wajib to spend on others okay he has to spend on his parents on his wife and his children those are the ones that are wajib on him and he doesn't do that even though he has the money, then he's classed as bakhil, and that is what is sinful. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on and describes a second category of people. Okay? And they hide what Allah has given them. So there is a bakhil who has money and he doesn't spend on himself, right? And there's a second kind of bakhil who hides what Allah has given him to the degree that he goes out and wears old clothes that are torn even though he's a multimillionaire, or he goes and drives uh, a broken down car so people don't think that he has uh, money and uh, you know this person is hiding what Allah has uh, given him Mujahid and some of the other tabi'een that are the Mufassirun of the Quran have said that these were the Yahud who had hid the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَكْتُمُونَ مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Ibn Jarir al-Tabari disagrees with Mujahid and says, the next ayah says, وَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ And the Yahud used to believe in Allah and the last day. Wallahu a'lam. So the Yahud did a lot of bukhul and one of the things they did was they would not share the ilm. 
They do have the knowledge, but they wouldn't give it. وَأَعْتَدْنَا لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا Now this ending, as I always keep saying to you, the endings of the ayat are a key to the ayat. وَأَعْتَدْنَا لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا What is the actual linguistic definition of kufr is comes from the farmer who takes a seed, digs the ground, and hides the seed in there. Okay? And then he leaves no trace of the seed there. So the kafir is the one who denies the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he says, I, I don't believe in that. Right? So that's called kufr. Or he says that Allah is not one. So he denies that. So Allah has given millions, hundreds of thousands of dollars to an individual and he doesn't have any athar of that on himself. Then he is kafir of the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one. Number two, if a person has been given a lot of wealth, the example is of a, uh, a, can, a pa packet of candies. You have five children, you take a packet of candies and you say to the youngest one, this is for everyone, you have to share it. Here's the packet of candy. All right? And what does the child do? He takes it and says, this is mine. So this is called kufran al -na right? Mm -hmm. So you are denying the ni'mah that you have been given, that what you have actually been given is for a lot of people. So you're earning, mashallah, $150,000 a year, more than enough for one person, and then you say that this is not enough for me, and you're not spending on yourself and not spending on anyone else. And this is a degree of kufr. Because the opposite of shukr is kufr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah, inna Allah la yuhibbu man kana mukhtalan fakura. He does not love the one who is mukhtalan fakur, and he puts the kafirin to jahannam. So the bukhul is something that is leads you to towards kufr. So stay away from that because Allah puts the kafir into Jahannam forever. But if someone is bakhil and stays a Muslim and dies on that, he doesn't go into Jahannam forever. But Allah is warning him of this. Okay, end of ayah, uh, you're allowed one question. Okay, only one? Only one question because okay. I really want to get to you know, move on. It's, it's good to be a bakhil. Like okay. In certain places, if you go overseas, yes. you see those people are not that rich but they are poor yes but when they see someone they start stealing them and putting them in okay that's a very different stuff. kind of situation you're talking about is uh, it is not necessary it is not necessary yes i know i understand that but that's a different perspective where you have to hide the wealth uh, to stop it from being stolen and uh, you have to hide the things to prevent the evil eye that's a different aspect but someone has been given wealth and he's wearing torn clothes then that's not that's not something that's desirable in the deen Allah has given you enough money go and buy new clothes and, and wear that okay uh, similarly the Prophet Sallallahu used to repair his own shoes okay so uh, you know that doesn't mean that we should go out and be wearing broken down shoes you have enough wealth go and buy new shoes wear proper shoes right? so there's a, there's a balance that needs to be kept there وَالَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ رِيَاءَ النَّاسِ وَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ The wow here is either a hal, meaning that the people who do bukhul uh, also have these characteristics, or it means the wow here is now a second category of people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like, or are in the same kind of you know nature of things. So one, Allah does not like bukhul, and the second, Allah does not like the one who is giving a lot, but giving for riya, as we mentioned in the last class. In a hadith that is authentic, that a man comes to the day of judgment and he has spent a lot of his wealth in his life, and he expects that he will get Jannah in return for that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys all of his a'mal and then puts him into Jahannam because of that. So he says, oh Allah, I gave so much of my wealth in the dunya, then I should get return for that. He said, you desired to get the praise of the people and you got that in the dunya. So you got what you got in the dunya, that was your intention, so you got it all, so you have nothing in the akhirah. So that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy uh, any uh, amal that is being done for uh, showing off and we did this last week and inshallah I don't want to spend too much time on this 
wala bil yawm al akhir the second wala here is for emphasis because these are a kind of people that are you know very low in character that you know if they had believed in the day of judgment then they wouldn't have done riya wa may yakun al shaytan lahu qareenan fa sa'a qareena the qareen is a very close kind of friend a friend that is attached to you all the time there are different use different words that are used in the arabic language for qareen uh, for friend and qareen is the kind that is very close spends all the time with you and is used multiple times in the quran so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says whoever has shaytan as his friend then that is the worst kind of friend because when you have the shaytan as your friend and you are following the shaytan all the time that will lead you to go to jahannam and the second meaning i didn't think about it but uh, ibn kathir mentions that when the shaytan is your qareen then the shaytan will also be in jahannam okay and so if he is your qareen that means that you are also in jahannam so one meaning is he will take you to jahannam and the second meaning is that you are in jahannam with the shaytan as your companion because the shaytan is definitely going to jahannam any questions Is a very good screen for those. For those, his, yes. His screen here as well as there. Yeah, so the that's right. From that perspective, yes. On his, on his promise, on his you friendship. can't see him here, but you will see him there. <laughs> وماذا عليهم لو آمنوا بالله واليوم الآخر وأنفقوا مما رزقهم الله. This is توبيخ which means that Allah سبحانه وتعالى is saying you know why is it that they're not believing okay so it is a use of reverse psychology you can say. وماذا can be saying أي شيء and can also be ما الذي okay what is it that they don't believe in Allah سبحانه وتعالى and give in infaq okay. There was a Sahabi that came to the Prophet ﷺ and said that my father had spent so much wealth and had released so many slaves and had bought so many uh, uh, girls that were going to be buried and he had bought them to save them. So will he be rewarded? And the Prophet ﷺ said that he didn't even for one day, uh, you know, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he will not be rewarded for that. Okay? It's a separate discussion on whether his adab is reduced or not, and we, we will come to that in a moment. He was not the, Muslim. He was not a Muslim. Okay, so he was the father of the Sahabi that died before Islam. And so the Prophet ﷺ said that because he did not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not be rewarded for all the good things that he did. So that's why Allah puts Law Amanu Billahi wal Yomil Akhiri first and wa anfaqumi marazakahumullahu second. You understand that connection? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also reminds us that it is the iman that leads you to infaq and infaq is tasdeeq on your iman. So when you mention the word sadaqah means that it is saying that your iman is actually truthful when you give the sadaqah, you actually believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you believe in a reward. There's an interesting discussion that philosophers have which is if we took out religion from the space of man, like this is how philosophers think, is the giving of money beneficial to you or not? Okay? And the way it is beneficial, if you look at it from an economic perspective, you know, whenever they talk about uh, interest rates in the country and they talk about the economy, everything is about consumer spending. When consumers are spending and buying, then the economy is running because of that okay i have money i need your services i get you to provide services i pay you money you then turn around and you need services from him and you pay him money he gets money he's provided you services he then has money and he says to you i need your services and so then the whole society is interacting with each other and providing and what happens is that if i'm miserly i have money and I'm keeping it in my bank account. I don't use your services, therefore you don't get money, then you don't use his services, all right? And what happens is the whole thing stagnates and it all stops. 
So when Allah says give to other people money, what he's actually doing, he's providing in everyone's accounts money so that there are more people spending, which means the economy runs better. Okay. So whether you look at it from the leftist perspective or the rightist perspective of politics, the giving of money in charity and aid actually makes economies better. And when rich companies give aid to poor countries, it actually helps the rich country as well. Okay? So in, in this way, philosophically and both from the perspective of the akhirah, the giving of money is actually directly beneficial to you. Because if you save money and keep on saving money, you might earn 200,000 this year and next year. But slowly as economy goes down, your earning capacity goes down and suddenly then you are unemployed and not earning anything at all because the economy has gone down. So giving the away of money is actually directly beneficial to you. If you look at it from the extreme perspective, you are giving money. So you think actually you're making a loss. But no, in fact, it all rotates and then comes around to you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ما نقص, the Prophet ما نقص من صدقة, that the mal is not decreased by the sadaqa وكان الله بهم عليما إن الله لا يظلم مثقال ذرة وإن تكو حسنته وضاعفها this is one of the eight ayat that Abdullah bin Abbas said is the best of the ayat that the sun has risen on because they you know make our life easy and secondly they are a glad tidings for us Allah does not do dhulm mithqala dharra now dharra we did in detail in surah al-zilzal okay and you will remember that a, a dharra has been described in multiple different ways so Abdullah bin Abbas says that it is an ant or the head of an ant okay now an ant, when you feel it on, on your hand, it is almost weightless from our perspective. If you had a very, very accurate weighing machine, you might be able to measure that it is in you know, mi grams or micrograms. Other people have said that the dharra is like a mustard seed or a part of a mustard seed. <coughs> Others still have said that the dharra is the small particles that you see in the air. If you have an open window and the sunlight is coming through, you can see that there are little particles that are going around and floating in the air. Imam al Qurtubi says that no, a dharra has to be something that is weighed because the dharra is weighed on the day of judgment. Every single dharra is weighed on the day of judgment, so it can't be something that is weightless and floating in the air. So at the very least, it is going to be a small mustard seed or a grain of sand or a grain of flour, something very, very tiny. And Allah says that he does not do dhulm of this amount at all. Imam Ibn Kathir brings a couple of hadith that are worth mentioning here. And he has done a very good tafsir of this ayah if someone wants to go and, and read it, uh, an extensive discussion is that uh, on the day of judgment will come a man who has done dhulm on other people okay and he has a lot of good deeds as well he has done fasting and he has done prayer and he has done other things and he comes on the day of judgment and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs to the malaika that those who he has done dhulm to then take his good deeds and give it to them okay he has cursed one person, he hasn't given one person's right, he has, you know, blocked someone's driveway, etc., etc. There's lots of things he has done. He's killed someone, all right? So Allah takes from his, the malaika take from his hasanat and give it to those people. And each one is coming in a line. And then he is left with one dharra of hasana. Okay? And the malaika come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, that he has one dharra of hasana. And Allah knows more than the malaika. But this is their role. Okay? And Allah says, Enter into Jannah with my mercy. And in a second hadith, a similar kind of man who has done much dhulm, all his hasanat are gone to other people, distributed. Everything he did is distributed. And the malaika come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that, 
everything is gone and there's still a line of people to do. So he said, okay, take from their sins and put it into his account until the line is finished and then he is thrown into Jahannam for what he has done. So Allah does not do dhulm of any kind. Now, uh, in here, Abu Huraira mentions a hadith regarding وَإِن تَكُ حَسَنَةً يُضَاعِفْهَا Imam ibn Kathir mentions that in one riwayah that one sahabi was told of a hadith that Abu Huraira narrated that Allah will <laughs> give 1,000, 1,000 reward for a good deed. So he went for hajj. They were in different parts of the khilafat. He went for hajj. He met Abu Huraira in, in hajj or, or umrah and asked him, did you narrate this? Okay. So one sahabi is checking from another sahabi, did you, did you really narrate this? Did you rate Alf Alf Hasana? He said no. Alfay Alf Hasana. Okay? So a million times, two million times. Right? Two million times the reward of the Hasana. So, and a, a particular thing that you have done, that Allah can reward it a million times, two million times. And we have given you examples of things that we can go into the billions, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in one hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards to 700 times. And in this hadith is al-fay alf, right? So that's two million times. Um, so it is according to the deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can increase it. And then yudha'ifha has been read with tashdeed in one narration to emphasize that Allah will multiply it and multiply it. So He will square it, you know, or I should say, uh, exponentially. exponentially increase it. And He will give from with Him a great ajr. So on the one hand, Allah does not do dhulm of even the smallest kind. And on the other hand, He increases the reward multiple times. A concept we have done before, so we can move on, inshallah. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا The Prophet وسلم, came to Abdullah bin Mas'ud عنه, and said to him, recite. <coughs> and he said, should I recite? And it has been revealed unto you. And he said, no, recite. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud recited Surah An-Nisa until he came to this ayah. And the Prophet وسلم, said hasbuk stop and his eyes were streaming with tears until that his beard was wet and what's interesting about this narration is that Abdullah bin Mas'ud had his head down he, while he was reading or he was reading from some leaflets okay and so one of the side points from this is a teacher can read to a student and a student can read to a teacher which is beneficial for us, right? In learning the Quran, it is necessary that the teacher should recite to the student so that the student can learn how to recite correctly. And the student should recite to the teacher even though the teacher knows more because that's how he will learn. So one of the things that Prophet ﷺ used to do, he would go to the Sahaba and when the wahi would come, he would say, write, and they would write. And then they would read that and if there were any mistakes, he would correct it right there and then. But also, the Sahaba were memorizing the Qur'an, so he would check that as well. So, there are other instances that I have described to you, other separate instances like in Surah Al-Bayyinah, uh, and this is the second of them. A second hadith is mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ went to one of the suburbs of the Ansar, and it's not mentioned who was asked to recite, but they also recited Surah Al-Nisa, and they also came to this ayah, this, and then he said, stop and the tears were coming down his beard as well. In that particular incident, although the hadith is weaker, he says that, and it's mentioned by At-Tabari, that I am shaheed on those who I am with. So how will I be a shaheed for those who come after me? And he doesn't answer it. Okay. In a, in a weak narration that Qurtubi mentions, 
that the a'mal will be presented to the people in the qubur like the parents and the anbiya on Friday. So the a'mal go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Monday and Thursdays and morning and evening. And in a very weak narration on the 15th of Sha'ban. But the sahih narrations are Monday, Thursday, Fajr and Asr. Okay? So it is desired that on those days, Monday and Thursday, we're doing more ibadah and morning and evening we are trying to do more ibadah than the other times of the day. But that the a'mal are also for our forefathers so that they can be proud of us are also presented on the day of Jumu'ah. Not, uh, you know, something that is necessary to, uh, you know, comprehend all that much, uh, but it is, you know, written in the tafsir of this ayah. How is a shaheed? The shaheed is mentioned in Surah Al-Zumar that on the day of judgment, the shuhada and the anbiya will be brought as witnesses for the people that we presented the deen to them. We gave them the knowledge about the deen and then they did not follow it or they followed it. You will be brought forth as the witness. The witnesses will be multiple levels. It will be the malaika, it will be your kitab, it will be your body, it will be other people, and most importantly, it will be the prophets themselves that will say that yes, I gave them the message and they did not respond. And because of this, this was the most difficult aspect for the Prophet wasallam. Because imagine that everyone who is not believing in him in Quraysh is actually his relative. Either a close relative or a distant relative. But they're all his relatives. And we don't, when they don't believe in him, this thing is very difficult for him to take. And that's why he was crying when he heard this, when he was reminded of this ayah by the Sahabi. In any sense, a prophet cannot be in control of his ummah, I mean, down the track like we are 1400 years after his presence. Yes. So, so that is also one point, you know, which proves him innocent, you know. Yes, so he's, he's innocent of that. The thing that he was finding difficult was that I'm going to be a shaheed on this entire ummah that's coming after me as well. And the biggest role of the Prophet is balagh, right? <coughs> presenting the religion. Well, in Urdu we say pegham, right? <coughs> to actually present it, that's the key role of prophethood. That he took promise in right. the Hujjat al That's right. So he took a promise and he said that, I have a witness, I am a witness that I have presented it to you. I have given you the message. And then obviously it is for us when we look at this is that we give the message to other people as well, right? Either we give that directly ourselves or we bring other people to the message. Any questions up to this point? Indeed, this ayah is very, very touching ayah. The concept of the Prophet ﷺ being a shaheed is mentioned in two other ayat, and I believe this is the first one that we have done. يَوْمَ إِذِينَ يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَعَصَوا الرَّسُولِ On that day, the people who do kufr and have disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ, they will wish that the earth would swallow them up. Or they would wish that the earth would open and they would fall under it. Okay? So, uh, in two different tafsir, one is that that happening is majhul, it is not told who is doing that. And in a second, it is that the earth is doing it. Why is that? Either they would wish that there is no. Uh, recompense, there is no punishment for what they have done or because everyone comes from the earth they would desire that they were never born in the first place and we did this in at the end of Surah Al-Naba what's the ayah? 
يقول الكافر يا ليتني كنت ترابا right it's a similar meaning there that the kafir would would want that he would be turned into dust and in that ayah I'll remind you that we mentioned the tafsir that a uh, goat that was horned had hit the unhorned goat in this dunya so Allah does not do dhulm of even a dharra so the goat that did not have a horn will be given horns and he will hit that goat that had hit him and then both of those animals will be turned into dust so the kafir will look at the scene and say that because they are about to go into Jahannam they would wish that they were like these animals that they would be turned into dust and everything would be finished for them that it would be presented that they were wrong in this dunya because obviously right now they don't believe that they are wrong mm. when you talk to them they say no we are right so on the day of judgment they will find out that they are wrong and they will wish strongly that this is the end that it doesn't go on from here وَلَا يَكْتُمُونَ اللَّهَ حَدِيثًا and they will not be able to belie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah al um, Surah al An'am, is it An'am? Wallahi, uh, Wallahi Rabbina, ma kunna mushrikeen is mentioned. So an Arabi came to Abdullah bin Abbas and said that there is ikhtilaf in the Quran that I want to ask you about. Okay? And Abdullah ibn Abbas said, do you have shak about the Qur'an? Do you have doubt about the Qur'an? He said, no. I just want to clarify, this appears to be some contradiction here. On the one hand, in one part of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the kuffar will say on the day of judgment, Wallahi rabbina ma kunna mushrikeen. That, oh Allah, our Rabb, we were not mushrik, even though they were mushrik. So that would be a lie. Okay? And Allah says they are saying this. And here Allah says, Allah haditha." They will not be able to lie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, look, there's an apparent contradiction. You are Abdullah bin Abbas, you explain it to me. So Abdullah bin Abbas said that there is no contradiction here. What will happen is that on the day of judgment, when the kuffar will start to see that those who are kafir are being thrown into Jahannam and only those who are Muslims are going into Jannah, they will hatch a plan and they will say that we will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were not mushrik. Okay, we will make a lie. And what will then happen is Allah will seal their mouths and their hands and their legs and their skin will give witness that they were mushrik okay and this ayah is true as well that they will not be able to say it and the other ayat is also true because they were hatching a plan in which they were going to lie so Abdullah bin Abbas explains the sequence of events that happen in the day of judgment وَلَا يَكْتُمُونَ اللَّهَ حَدِيثًا the next ayah, the subject changes, so I'll give you one question. Yeah, I heard the Dr. Ghulam Malik regarding this ayah. He said uh, about this ayah that the mushrik uh, won't be lying, but they will be like kind of after seeing the azab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will be so like uh, dizzy or um, out of their brains. Yes, in desperation. Yeah. In desperation. So they'll be saying double, double kasam. It's, it's yes. a double swearing. Wallahi Wallahi yeah. uh, they were swearing yeah. double, you know, but yeah. but they were they are not lying actually because yeah. they know Allah knows that better than what we say. That's an interesting uh, way to explain it. I haven't That's heard that before. Wrong, wrong Malik, he explains this out. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Ya yuladin amanu, la taqarabu salata wa antum sukara. Did you guys bring your notebooks? One person has their notebook, yes? Okay, so you're going to be needing to make notes in this ayah because we'll be doing a lot of fiqh. So we have less than half an hour. We'll get through what we can. Whatever we don't get through, we'll do next week, inshallah. Next week is the last class before Ramadan. Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu la taqarabu salata wa antum sukara Do not go near the prayer whilst you are drunk. 
حتى تعلموا ما تقولون until you know what you are saying in the asbab al nuzul abdul rahman bin auf radiyallahu anhu who is one of the 10 who are promised jannah okay of course there are more sahaba that will go to jannah but these are the 10 that have been pointed in one hadith where the prophet ﷺ said that these are going to jannah one night he got drunk and then he prayed fajr and he read قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ and he misread the ayat okay so instead of saying that we don't worship what you worship he said we worship what you worship all right so he was not even aware of what he is saying he was that drunk and this ayah was revealed and there are other events that are similar to that that include other sahaba where they had a get together they got drunk and then they prayed and uh, said the wrong things when they were reciting this is the second of the ayat to be revealed in the order of the prohibition of alcohol the first ayah we did already yes alunaka anil khamri wal maisir that is mentioned in surah al-baqarah this is the second and it, this is revealed before badr and uh, the third is later on in the Medinan period, much later on, that is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is Fahal and which ends with Fahal Antum Muntahun, and that was the prohibition of alcohol. In this, you are uh, aware of a story where Umar radiallahu anhu, when the first ayah of the prohibition, not the prohibition, the ayah to say that uh, Khamar has got more bad things than good things. Omar said, Oh Allah, give us an ayah that is shafi and clear. <coughs> this ayah came and he said, Oh Allah, give us an ayah that is shafi and clear. And then the third ayah was re revealed uh, of that. And this is one of the uh, things that show the fadila of Omar radiallahu anhu. The shafi'i say, that la taqarabu salata here means don't come close to the masjid the jama'ah okay and the hanafis say that don't come close to the prayer full stop until you know what you are saying you should not be praying which is closer to the wording of the ayah here in a sense it is similar to the one who is majnoon Okay, the one who is majnoon, who has gone crazy, he's lost his mind, then uh, he's not going to pray because he has no idea what he is doing and the qalam is being removed from him. The difference between the one who is drunk and the one who is majnoon is that the majnoon is, does not have qada. And the one who ha is drunk has qada. Okay, so when the time passes and the drunkenness goes away, whatever prayers he has prayed or not prayed, he has to do them again. Okay, so he was drunk for 10 hours within it came Asar, Maghrib, Isha and he wakes up at Fajr time and now the drunkenness is gone even though he prayed Maghrib while he was drunk and Isha while he was drunk he had no idea what he was doing he has to pray those prayers again whereas a Majnoon who becomes temporarily Majnoon then there is no Qadha on him in this Imam Al-Qurtubi discusses what things can be done uh, or what things are legally valid when a person is drunk which is a good time to discuss this I think so for example if someone is drunk and does a nikah it is valid <laughs> if someone is drunk and does a divorce it is valid okay if someone is drunk and he shoots someone or something like that the punishment will be on him okay <laughs> What Imam Shafi'i says that you won't do the punishment un until his drunkenness is gone and you will do the punishment after that. The one who is majnoon and he does all of that, those things are not valid. Right? Now why is that? Because when a person drinks, he chooses to drink. He's intentionally doing that. Right? He's intentionally drinking. And when you drink to a certain point, so alcohol causes disinhibition. Right, you lose control. So when you drink to a certain point, then you keep on drinking. But the beginning part of it, you still have control. The first few drinks, as described medically, right? 
the first few drinks under a certain limit, you still have control. Beyond a, a typical limit, you lose control. Some people are missing genes in their metabolism and they lose control after the very first drink. Now when a person knows that he does that, he should not drink at all, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that alcohol has more good things than bad things. And now he's saying, don't come close to the prayer if you are drunk, right? So pe people who are the Sahaba at the time should realize, even though it's not haram, this, is, this really cannot be good. If we can't pray when we are drunk, this really can't be good. Sorry, correction. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Uh, you said drink, uh, alcohol has more good things. More it bad things more than bad good things. things. So yeah, Jazakallah khair. حَتَّى تَعْلَمُوا مَا تَقُولُونَ وَلَا جُنُبًا إِلَّا عَابِرِي سَبِيلٍ حَتَّى تَغْتَسِلُوا Neither a junub should pray. And Imam Abu Hanifa says that a junub should not enter the masjid either. Okay? Imam Shafi'i says that if the part of the masjid is also a place of passage, then he can pass through, even though he is Junub. Um, an example is old cities would have houses connected to Masajid, and they wouldn't necessarily have the bathroom inside the houses. So to go take a shower, he would necessarily have to pass a Masjid. This is not desirable, but Imam Shafi'i allows it. Even still we have masaj, uh, in Masajid, we have showers there. Yes, you know, so... Take showers there. It can be that someone is staying inside the masjid and he becomes junub and his only place of showering is within the grounds of the masjid. Mm -hmm. So he will go and use that. How does janaba happen? Just to describe it. The janaba happens with the ejaculation in a wet dream or through intercourse. Okay? In the very beginning, in the very beginning, I'll come to you inshallah. In the very beginning of Islam, if a person did intercourse but did not do ejaculation, then he only had to do wudu. So after the Prophet ﷺ, there was some ikhtilaf between the Sahaba on whether after this situation he has penetrated but not done ejaculation, whether he has to do wudu or he has to do ghusl. And through the discussion amongst the Sahaba, they had ijma' that he has to do ghusl in this situation. Alright? So according to the tafsir of Imam Shafi'i, the abiri sabilin is the one that's passing through the uh, masjid. And uh, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, the Abiri Sabilin is the traveler. So uh, here we will come on to the uh, meanings of Tayammum. The Ghusl, just to mention the Ikhtilaf here, the Ghusl, the minimum is that a person washes his entire body once. And according to Imam Abu Hanifa, he has to do the mouth and they nose okay because that is uh, part of the ghusl as opposed to the wudu is not wajib imam ahmad bin hanbal considers the mouth and the nose as part of the face and because the face is a fard then he considers that to be a fard as well so at the one extreme is ahmad bin hanbal and imam abu hanifa and Imam Shafi'is and Imam Malik at the other end where they don't consider that to be a necessary part of the ghusl. The sunnah of the ghusl is that a person will wash his hands first, then he will do a quick wudu, and then he will start with his right side, then his left side, uh, obviously uh, washing his private parts in the beginning, and washing his entire body once and getting water to the roots of the hairs and the beard. The woman has the allowance that if she normally has braids or locks, she does not have to open them to make it easy for the uh, woman. She still has to get her hair wet. A person, so I gave a khutbah series on tahara, over four or five khutbahs 
can't remember how many khutbahs I did. So one person asked me a very interesting question. I thought, what kind of people are in the dunya? But anyway, you know, it's a good thing that people ask you questions because you, you learn where people are deficient in their knowledge. And he said that. I heard someone saying that when he does ghusl, he doesn't wash his head and above, and he washes everything below that. So he said, so I said, the ghusl is not complete until you wash everything. And because he didn't do ghusl, all of those prayers need to be repeated as well. Right? Because he never had the wudu for them. He never had tahara for them. Okay, a question. Yes, okay, we'll start the yamum. So I'll allow you a question. And, you, and he had a question as well. Actually, he should go first. You. Yes. No, 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 you are first. No, I just wanted to ask you if you can elaborate on the Abiri Sabil because I didn't really quite. Abiri Sabilin uh, is. Imam Abu Hanifa okay. said that a traveler mm -hmm. and uh, Imam Shafi said that going through the masjid, I didn't quite understand. Okay. Wala Junuban illa Abiri Sabilin hatta taghtasilu that the person who is Musakkar, he should not pray. Yep. And the person who is Junub yep. should not pray. Hatta yep. taghtasilu. Yep. And the one who is a traveler is being given the allowance of tayammum. Tayammum. Oh, right? Okay. Because typically the Abiri Sabil yep. doesn't have water. Yep, okay. okay. And I'll come to the conditions of yep. that. Now I understand it now because. Jazakallah. Okay. I didn't really explain it very well. Yes. So the first sukkat uh, here in the ayat. Yep. After that, do you have to do the ghusl as well? No. The ghusl here is being connected to the janaba. Okay? And the ta'alamu ma taquluna is being connected to the sukara. Now what do you say about the dream? Uh, okay. The person has a wet dream. The definition of a wet dream is the person has gone to sleep and he has an ejaculation while he is sleeping. Then he has. Then he becomes junub. And he has to take a ghusl because of that. There's a second kind of person who goes to sleep. He dreams of intercourse, but he does not have ejaculation. And he wakes up and he is has tahara. He is not junub. Okay? Oh, so it's a dream. The wet dream is yeah. the dream. Yeah, I know that, but... Yes. He sees something, right? Regardless of whether he sees something or he doesn't no, see you something. Said intercourse and no then I'll still okay. understand. Let me clarify it. Yeah. Okay, very plain English, inshallah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's so in the dream. When someone is sleeping, yep. okay, doing the sleep, he has an ejaculation. Yep. That's classified as a yep. wet dream. Yep. Regardless of whether he saw something in his sleep or not. Or not. Yep. Yep. Another person has seen something in his sleep. He is seeing himself doing everything. Yeah, yeah. But he doesn't have an ejaculation. So like he, wa he wakes up, he checks himself, there yeah. is no fluid there. Yeah. Then he is not classified as a wet dream. Yeah, okay. Do you understand this yeah, now? Understand that, yeah. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, we have to have we have to clarify ejection? these things. Sorry. Yes, yeah, Sukara. Uh, if anybody has any no. uh, if it goes outside, ejaculation happens without any dream. Yes. Okay, that is a separate thing, and uh, I will need to answer you next week about that. Uh, so there is a special category of uh, uh, answers related to the person who has um, what is called uh, early ejaculation, or he's not having intercourse and he has ejaculation. This is a kind of disease, and there's a, a separate answer for that. I want to check the answer and then get back to you, inshallah. Does that answer all the, the questions? Yep. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَىٰ أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ مِنْ الْغَائِطِ أَوْ لَا أَمَسْتُمْ النِّسَىٰ These are the four things, right, that Allah says. And then the condition He puts in, that you don't find money, we don't find water, فَتَيَمَّمُوا Okay? You understand the broad overview. Now we'll talk about these four things in detail. وَإِن كُمْ مَرْضَىٰ You are sick. Okay? And the degree of sickness is of two types. One is that if water touches you, you will get sicker. Okay, so uh, the example is someone has a pneumonia, okay, and he is suffering fevers or something, and the only water he has is cold water. If he does wudu from that, his pneumonia will get worse. It will either be prolonged or he may die as a result of it. Just the fact that he has pre fear of it being prolonged is sufficient cause for doing tayammum. Okay, 
one explanation. The second is someone is sick and he becomes weak to be able to do wudu. You have to raise your leg to do wudu. Or someone is so weak that just getting the water out and washing himself, he is unable to do anymore. And you have seen all people who become bedridden, right? They become so weak. They are people who just had surgery, they're in hospital, they're lying in a bed, they can't do anything. Yeah. All right, all they can do is tayammum, that's it, right? So they are being given the allowance of doing tayammum as well. The second is ala safar, they're on a journey. Okay? And uh, the safar here is of any type. It doesn't necessarily mean to have a length or a number of days. A person is classed as a traveler when he leaves his town. Okay, And here you want to understand something. I went to a mechanic and he started arguing with me that none of the four madhahib have any evidence for 85 miles or 86 miles or kilometers. Or I said, I agree with that. That's not the point. The, the fiqh is, is not necessarily got from a hadith of every single type. We have to look at what the Sahaba did and the Fuqaha based their decisions on the actual action. So even though you don't find a hadith saying you have to travel 85 kilometers before you can do Qasr and all these things, we take them from the principles of Fiqh. That's, so, so when a person is traveling, just because I remember I want to say it, you will need to take the boundaries of the time, town. So when you start to see this, the, the sign, Welcome to Sydney, that's where you measure from so I prayed in Bukhari house one day and someone prayed behind me I missed two rakah of Zuhar so I got up he was Shafi he joined me and he so I had to complete two rakah I prayed that I said salam and so he prayed two rakah and he said salam so I said okay he must be a traveler so I was doing dhikr and he was doing dhikr so I said salam to him and I went to ask his name and said where are you from I said, uh, you're traveling, so where are you traveling from? He said, oh, I'm traveling from Lakamba. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of uh, you know, ignorance you have. So the, the travel starts from the boundary of the city or the town, and you measure the distance from there. Regardless of that, when a person is traveling, Imam Abu ha according to Imam Abu Hanifa, the distance of where he searches for water is one mile. Okay. If he doesn't find water within one mile, he can do tayammum. Or he is traveling and he fears for his things. That if he were to leave them, someone would come and steal them. Or the well is being guarded by enemies. Or the well is being guarded by beasts or things like that that can harm him. In all of those situations, he can do tayammum. Imam Shafi's distance is what he can see to the horizon. So for him, it is much further away. Okay, and he, uh, you know, uh, different books of uh, Shafi, I think you'll find the different d distances described. The easiest one is the, the Hanafi one, and the further distance is the Shafi one. Why is it in, the, in traveling that Tayammum is done? Is that typically, when you go in traveling, you carry a small amount of water, sufficient only for drinking that if you did wudu with it, you would not be able to drink. So you don't count the drinking water for it. All right. If you're traveling with a group of people and that group of people have enough water for wudu, then you're obliged to ask them. If they then say, we won't share your wudu, then you can do. Uh, we, we, we won't share our water, then you can do wudu. أو على سفر أو جاء أحد منكم من الغائط. The غائط is the place where they used to go to answer the call of nature, either to urinate or defecate. They would leave the city, the town, and go to that place and urinate there, and then come out. So Allah has used that as a nickname for حدث الأصغر, anything that breaks the wudu, which is urination, defecation, or passing of air. We're going to do Lamastum al Nisa and then stop there. And then from next week, I'll describe the Tayammum in detail because it's going to be time for prayer. I want you to understand what Lamastum al Nisa means because there's ikhtilaf in this matter. Okay? Imam al Shafi'i says that if you touched a woman, then your wudu is gone. 
and I went to we used to have a fruit shop in the corner and I went there and the woman was very particular and not touching my hands and I said you you were very careful in doing that I said yeah because some of the brothers they really insist that I must be very careful when I give the money that I don't touch their hands otherwise they have to go and do wudu so then I looked it up at that time and I was amazed to see that Imam Shafi's opinion is that any touching of the man with any woman will break his wudu in terms of age uh, that's a very good question. I have not looked that up. Could be smaller, younger. I would. I will have to look that up. Right. Uh, Imam Malik and Ahmad bin Hanbal add that the touching is with the desire. Okay, so they have made it a little bit easy. Imam Bu Hanifa is the easiest. Okay, that a person can touch his wife, kiss her, hug her, and his wudu is not broken. And he, the Imam Bu Hanifa, brings forth some ahadith that are very strong. The Prophet Sallam was praying just outside his room and he was praying tahajjud and it was the turn of Aisha radiallahu anha okay so she woke up and she saw the prophet is not there okay so she put her hand out and he was in sujood and she touched the prophet's leg and saw that he is in sujood and she put her hand back inside her room and the prophet did not go and do wudu but he continued praying Another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the house of the Prophet ﷺ used to be very small, enough that when he, he would uh, pray, the Aisha would, would stretch her legs, okay, and would be in front of the Prophet ﷺ. And when he would come to do sujood, he would poke her. And so she would pull her legs in so that he could do sujood. The description of how small their houses were. But that poking of the wudu, what is he doing? He's actually touching her which is his wife and then his wudu is not being broken according to the Hanafi madhab if the private part meets the private part then the wudu is broken and then with penetration is the ghusl فَلَمْ تَجِدُوا مَاءً inshallah we will start from next week جزاكم الله خير do I stop that?